Hey, how's it going everybody? Matt Houston here and today we're going to talk about Matthew Mercer's Gunslinger Archetype for 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons and I really like this. Uh, I've seen it played plenty by uh, Towson on uh, Critical Role and uh, yeah, let's just get right into it. Gunslinger. F uh, f so it's a martial archetype for the fighter class. Uh, so most warriors in combat specialists spend their years perfecting the classic arts of swordplay, archery, polearm tactics. Whether duelists or infantry, martial weapons are seemingly perfected long ago and the true challenge is to master them. However, some minds cannot stop with the innovation of the crossbow, experiment with alchemical compounds, and rare metals have unlocked the secrets of controlling explosive forces. The few who survive these trials are of ingenuity may become the fir first to create the deft wield of firearms. This archetype focuses on the ability to design, craft, and utilize powerful yet dangerous ranged weapons. Though creative, in, invol though creative in, invention and uh, immaculation aim, you may become destined for a uh, distant force of death on the battlefield. However, not being a perfect science, firearms carry an inherent instability that can occasionally leave you without a functional means of attack. This is the danger of new, untested technologies in a world where arcane energies that rule the elements are ever pre present. Should this path of powder, fire, and metal call to you, keep your wits about you. Hold on to your conviction as a fighter and let your skills meet luck to guide your bullets to strike true. So simply put, you are you're you're, you're unique if you're a gunslinger for the most part uh, in a typical D and D world. Gunslingers are generally not there. They sometimes appeared as um, arcane in from things like the from a from an alchemist or an artificer kind of idea. Um, but typically they were meant as a, but that's still magical. It's not really a, a powder, um, alchemical metal based compound that allowed you to do that. Most of them were gun-like in design, but not really gun-like in function. They were typically arcane. So of course you get all your typical fighter stuff, your martial, uh, your extra attacks, your, uh, benefits to being just a general fighting class, all your uh, ability score improvements, and the, of course the access to the great multitude of feats in there as well, which will still benefit you greatly as being a uh, fighter, as well as the weapon, as well as the vast array of weapons and armors proficiencies, which will still grant you a lot of benefits while trying to utilize guns in a very effective manner. So in addition to this, let's see what you also get here. So firearm proficiency, starting at, when you choose this archetype at third level, you gain proficiency with firearms, allowing you to add your proficiency bonus to the attacks made with the firearms. In addition, you get gunsmith at third level. Upon choosing this archetype at third level, you gain proficiency with tinker's tools. You may use them to craft ammunition at half the cost, repair damaged firearms, or even draft and create new ones, DM's discretion. Some extremely experimental and intricate firearms are only available through crafting. Fairly reasonable and pretty standard, I would say, in a world where guns don't exist. Uh, if you do come across someone else that has innovations, they're probably different enough from your design that you may have to re-adjust or rebuild them from the ground up in order to utilize them effectively or be able to even fire them correctly or they may not even be that good they may be a less good version of a firearm that you have uh, the fact that you have to craft these is actually something that's pretty pretty pr um, nice about this is it makes you very different from every other fighter is that you need to be capable of creating such things which is very different from any other fighter who typically doesn't have a whole lot of abilities outside of I fight stuff and I'm really, really good at it. And sometimes I have skills. Additionally, and lastly, I think I want to say yes, lastly at third level, when you choose this archetype at third level, you learn to perform perfect or powerful rather uh, trick shots to disable or damage your opponents using your firearm. So trick shots, you learn two trick shots of your choice, which are detailed in the trick shot uh, below. So table below uh, many maneuvers enhance uh, an attack in some way. Each use of the trick shot must be declared before the attack roll is made. You can only use one trick shot per attack. You learn an additional trick shot of your choice at 7th, 10th, 15th, and 18th level. Each time you learn a new trick shot, you can also replace one trick shot you know with a different one. Grit. You gain a number of grit points equal to your wisdom modifier. Mill of one. You gain one ex uh, expanded grip point each time you roll a 20 on the 20 on the d20 
roll for an attack with your firearm or deal a killing blow with a firearm to a creature of significant threat, DM's discretion. You gain all expended grit points after a short or long rest. So I actually really, really like this. Um, wisdom is typically not a particularly important stat for fighters, so this is a good way of expanding what they need. Uh, the, the main archetypes that are out there uh, utilize your dexterity and your strength and your constitution, of course, depending upon the fighting styles or weapons that you intend to use. If you to, intend to use heavy armor, you're going to go you know, high strength, low dexterity. And in either case, having a strong constitution will always benefit you a lot as a fighter. In this case, it may not, depending upon the ranges of the guns. Um, from my understanding, the ranges of guns are pretty similar to that uh, kind of like between a crossbow and a longbow. Uh, so you do have quite the range on your weapons, and this may deal quite a bit into whether or not you do grab your constitution. Uh, in addition, uh, being able to get back on critical hits, you know, relying kind of like on that luck factor that you know, hopefully this works kind of idea, and it really kind of comes true a little bit more when you have to roll a 20 to keep in, in the game. The Eldritch Knight uses intelli intelligence, which, uh, you know, other than that archetype, has no purpose for the fighter on a surface mechanical level. Uh, of course, getting everything back on a short or long rest, pretty standard for your fighters. Uh, being able to get all your resources on short rests is very, very good, uh, meaning that you can kind of just go all in every fight, and, you know, take a breather when everybody else needs to take a breather as well, and you get all your stuff back. Pretty typical of a fighter. I really like, I actually like this a lot. I think this is pretty available. And even if wisdom, your wisdom um, isn't a particularly high score, because you're still going to want your con your dexterity, and even if your wisdom is your third, which if in the standard array is still only a plus two in most cases, you only have two grit. Having only two grit can be painful, but being able to get it back on creature of significant uh, threat kills, as well as natural 20s, gives you a pretty good ability to utilize it a little more often than the spell slots of your war team warlock, actually, for that matter, which is pretty good. We'll see how uh, dangerous these trick shots are pretty, uh, pretty shortly. They're listed here, but we'll see how dangerous these are. Some of your trick shots require your target to make saving throws to resist the trick shot effects. Saving throw DC is calculated as follows. A trick shot, which is your proficiency bonus plus your dexterity plus eight. So this is going to be, of course, to be your primary stat. So it is going to be pretty hard to resist your uh, sh trick shot DCs, much like any spellcaster. Quick draw. When you reach seventh level, you add your proficiency bonus to your initiative. You can also stow a firearm, then draw another firearm in a single object interaction on your turn. So this is typically a part of your movement that you can draw or stow a single object. Uh, this allows you to draw and stow two objects, so long as they're both firearms. So you can fire out a gun, put it away, pull out another one, and fire out more. So this lets you kind of like sw do that Call of Duty swap tactic, where if your gun runs out, you just swap to the other one and keep shooting. Rapid Repair. Upon 10th level, you learn how to quickly attempt to fix a jammed gun. You can spend a grit point to attempt to repair a misfire, but not broken, firearm as a bonus action. We'll get into misfires a little bit later. They don't actually go into how the gun actually operates until the end of this document, unfortunately, uh, by the looks of things. So a lot of this is going to make a lot more sense once we get to the end of this document. Lightning Reload. Starting at 15th level, you can reload any firearm as a bonus action. This is really, really good. Being able to reload your gun on a class that typically doesn't utilize their bonus action too much outside of second wind for this one specifically i don't think there's very much else that they use as bonus actions especially on a class that doesn't have any feats that would particularly benefit that utilize the bonus action uh this is a very powerful effect and it's not like you'll be using this every single turn but this means that you will be firing three times around at this point and firing three times around is you're going to be rolling through those ammunitions pretty fast so we'll see how uh so we'll see how much this benefits it as we get to the actually how the guns work at the end vicious intent at 18th level you your firearm attack score a critical hit on the roll of 19 or 20 and you regain a grip point on a roll of 19 or 20 on the d20 attack roll with a firearm this is nice the expanded critical is always good doubling your crit range is quite strong also at 18th level hemorrhaging critical 
Upon 18th level, whenever you score a critical hit on attack with a firearm, the target additionally suffers half of the damage from the attack at the end of its next turn. So this is actually pretty insane because this actually turns a critical into a triple critical uh, because it says half of the damage, not half of the dice or half of your weapon damage or an additional weapon damage dice like it does with the brutal critical of the of the barbarian. This means that if you have, say, uh, 2d10 plus 1d6 plus 1d4, this means that its effective damage is now triple that. So it's 6d10, 3d6, 3d4. Now, this doesn't do all the damage up front, but being able to do, you know, an additional 30 damage... At the end of the creature's next turn, after you already just dealt 60 damage to it, uh, this also stacks a sharpshooter. Like it's so powerful. This does so. Uh, you are a like if you get a critical, you are going to do a ton of damage. So overall, this is actually a pretty good fighter type. Uh, this is one of those things where there's a lot of things that you can do because you become a tinkerer. So you're there's a lot of things that you can do with tinkering uh, to really amp up your character in. Um, a mechanic or inventor kind of way. This puts you in like the spot of the tinkerer, right? It, it makes you an inventor. You're you're someone that's creating something. It means that you can often supply input to how things are being done on a literal mechanical level, as in like how something is being made or whether or not somebody has something that's being built and you can do something with that. Uh, a block and tackle, you know, you would have proper understanding of how this is used on like, you know, half your party and Probably most players at the table, for that matter, not having a clue what a block and tackle may actually be. Let's get into the trick shots here. So these are trick shots presented in alphabetical order. You get two, and then you get an additional one at 7, 10, 15, and 18, giving you a grand total of six trick shots by the end game. So you get the bullying shot, which lets you add your, gives you advantage on charisma checks. This is mostly so that you can kind of like do a, a close shot to intimidate someone. Dazzling shot, uh, the creature suffers normal damage, but needs to make a constitution saving throw or receive disadvantage. Dead eye, which, means, which gives you advantage. Uh, disarming, which, you know, they need to drop one health object and or and that object is pushed 10 feet away, which is the big thing here is that the object is no longer at their feet. The disarming ability that you can do by default is not particularly amazing, um, simply because someone could just pick up their weapon and... Now you've given up your attack, so they just have to pick up the weapon, which, by the way, they can do as part of their movement. It's not very, very good. To have certain rules that you have to spend your bonus action or spend a portion of your movement to pick up objects, typically, just so that it's not not worth, or so that it is worth, rather, uh, doing these things. Typically, it doesn't come up anyways because a lot of the time, disarming doesn't matter because you can just say that you're going to do non-lethal damage to something as you're going to attack it. So when something takes damage, you can just go, I knock them out instead. But of course, this is very handy. It's good in a number of circumstances. And being able to disarm certain targets can really cripple them. So forceful shot, you can spend grit. And if... They may need to make a strength save or be pushed 15 feet. This is very, very dangerous. Pushing people around is dangerous because you can push them into terrible environmental problems. And as a result, things can become quite dangerous quite quickly because there might be an unsuspecting pit or cliffside. So piercing shot is a little complicated. So the initial attack is plus one on the misfire score. And they suffer damage as normal. And you make the attack roll at disadvantage against every creature in the line directly behind the first one that you fired at. Only the first one can misfire. So the big thing of this is if people are in a line, this is basically kind of like the uh, fighter equivalent or rather the gunslinger's equivalent of a um, of a lightning bolt. This is very, very useful. It's the full, it's the full range of the weapon too. So you can hit stuff that's very far away. Having a plus one on the misfire chance means that you're going to be missing a little more often, but the payout can be huge because this means that you can do additional damage to every single creature there. Because they're not prone, that means that you have disadvantage on your attacks because you're doing ranged attacks. But this means that the 
fighter and other fighter in the front line or the rogue or whoever has advantage on the attack rolls now and that's very beneficial to other members of your party. So Violent Shot works a little bit differently. You, so you can expend more than one grit to, to increase the volatility of your attack. So for each one you expend, you have to make an attack roll at plus two on the misfire. So this gets really, really dangerous. But you get to roll one additional weapon die per grit. So this is where the damage really stacks up. And this is if you get the hemorrhaging crit with this. Because remember, it's an additional attack damage die. So this means that if you crit, you also double that as well. So this is actually pretty insane if you can hit it. It's a high risk, high reward, but it's pretty good. So of course we get into the firearm properties here. So firearms, firearms are new and volatile technology and as such bring their own unique set of weapon properties. Some properties are followed by a number and this number significant an element of that property outlined below these properties replace the optional ones presented in the dungeon master's guide firearms are ranged weapon. the weapon can be fired a number of times equal to its reload score before you must spend one attack or one or one action to reload you must have one free hand to reload the firearm misfire whenever you make an attack roll with a firearm and you and the dice roll is equal to or lower than the weapon's misfire score the weapon misfires the attack misses, and the weapon cannot be used again until you spend an action to try and repair it. The repair your firearms must be must be make a successful DC must make a successful Tinker's Tools check versus the DC equal to eight plus the misfire score. If your check fails, the weapon is broken and must be mended out of combat at a quarter of the cost of the firearm. Creatures who use a firearm without being proficient increases the weapon's misfire by one. Explosive. Upon hit, everything within five feet of the target must make a dexterity saving throw equal to DC of eight plus your proficiency plus your dexterity bonus. Or suffer 1d8 fire damage. If the weapon misses, the ammunition fails to detonate or bounces away harmlessly before doing so. So, few things here. Reload mechanic. I like this reload mechanic. I really, really like this reload mechanic. This means that this goes with the idea that you can just bang. You can keep that you have extra packs of ammunition ready to go and you can just flip a switch or a trigger or something on the side of your gun, slap it in and keep firing. The misfire, I love misfire. It goes along very greatly with the idea that this is new technology. It's unstable, it's powerful, but it's dangerous. And I like the whole repair as well as it becoming broken. I like the way that this is done. Uh, Explosive is a nice little addition. I didn't think of anything like this, but I like this. This is a nice little addition to add an extra little bit of versatility to your arsenal. Ammunitions. All firearms require ammunition to make an attack. And due to their rare nature, am ammunitions may be near impossible to find or purchase. However, if materials are gathered, you can craft ammunitions yourself using a tinkerer's tools check at half the cost. Each firearm uses its own unique ammunition and is generally sold or crafted in batches listed below next to the price. So you got a lot of different kinds of ammunition that you need to keep track of. Um, and yeah, so let's take a look at a few of these weapons here. So there's the palm pistol, the pistol, the musket, paper box... Sorry, pepper box, not paper box, pepper box, blunderbuss, bad news, and hand motor. Interesting. So they all do piercing damage with the exception of the hand motor. Sorry, the mortar. My bad. Which, of course, deals a 2d8 fire damage, which is interesting. So let's see here. So the reload is, of course, a 1 for the palm pistol. This is a very simple gun. This is probably the first gun that you're going to have. But it's, it's very simple, it's decent, it's akin to the hand crossbow, a little bit better than a hand crossbow. It's also light, which means that you can use it in a si on as a sidearm if you wish, or with a sword. But you cannot reload it unless you stow a weapon. It's pretty interesting in that regard. Uh, the pistol, a 2d10, so more attributive to the heavy crossbow. Uh, ranges and reload this is more of your big first gun is this pistol here and it misfires on ones pretty appropriate uh, musket is your good is pretty much your ranged your good long range weapon it's pretty good uh, deals good damage two-handed reload misfire of two it only fires a single shot so you know be careful with it paper box is kind of like your middle ground it's a good sized gun has decent uh, damage has good range 
It's definitely better than the pistol, and it has a larger magazine. It does misfire on it too, but the extra range and extra re reload space makes it quite good. Uh, Blunderbuss, of course, is a much simpler, uh, difficult weapon to wield. It reloads on one, but it does a lot of damage. 2d8, that's a lot of damage on a weapon without enchantments. And uh, this, you know, short range, it's it's kind of like akin to your typical shotgun in video games, but damn, is it going to pack a punch with 2d8. That's a lot of damage. Averaging a 9 damage around just off of that alone, plus your modifiers, this is going to do a lot of damage. Of course, we get the crafted ones. These are very interesting. Bad news. I think that's a I think that's a talisman creation. Truth be told, I don't know what a bad news is supposed to be. Um, a hand motor, a hand, a hand mortar, mortar is an interesting idea. I will say that though. But bad news, of course, dealing two d twelve, tons of damage, good ranges for both the short and long. Two-handed, it does reload on one, and it does misfire on three. So it is a sniper's weapon, and of course, it is a heavy risk weapon. But the payouts for this is absolutely staggering when compared to other guns. All in all, I like these. However you want, want to do things is, of course, up to you. And I do like how you have to have a hand free to reload. There, uh, To my understanding, he, Matthew Mercer, did make some feats for this. And I imagine uh, one of them is something sort of like that crossbow uh, feat where you gotta have the, the benefit of being able to fire in close range. Uh, being able to uh, not ignore the reload property, but being able to utilize the reload property, even if you have guns in both hands. Uh, you still probably have to abide by the typical um, rules, which is you have to have them both as light weapons, which would be good as, which is for the palm pistols, unless you take the dual wielding feat, which would allow you to extend that to anything that is not two-handed, which means that you could actually, in theory be wielding two blunderbusts in that case, if uh, if we were to put it that way. Um, or two hand motors. <laughs> oh, man, that is a dangerous idea. I love it. Oh, that is, that's silly. That is ridiculously silly. Two blunderbusts. Yeah, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. I love it. Uh, same thing with the pepper box, of course. You can have just two of those and just ruin people's days. <sighs> Oh, man, I, I really like this. I like this archetype. I think it's really well crafted. I think it's definitely arguably a little better than the battle master in some ways because you get a lot of the you get a lot of different stuff. But I think this stuff is arguably a little better in a number of ways. I mean, it's, it's different. I shouldn't say it's better. It's definitely different. You get a lot of other nice utilities with the battle master. The battle master is more of an upfront fighter where this is more of a, hey, I'm going to hang out way in the back, way in the back. And just blow people's limbs off with, you know, volatile shot and deadly shot and, or dead eye shot rather, and, you know, and, and just pierce through everybody because I can do that. It's, I, I really like this. I think it's really well done. Well done, Matthew Mercer. As always, you have created some fantastic stuff. So, what do you guys think? Do make a comment below in the Trolls Nest on the underside of this video. And, uh, yeah, until next time, guys. Have a good day.